aperture. So I'm Tara Pollock, I'm the Director of Photography at Time, and as Bill introduced, and this is Jonathan D. Woods. And I'm going to say that because his byline has become very famous recently um, based on this photograph that he made. And um, he is on my staff at Time, he's a photo editor. He, is, he runs the Time.com photo staff. He is the senior photo editor for Time.com Photo and Interactive. So his day job is breaking news. It's about you know finding the best pictures in breaking news situations. It's about you know the culture of news, and his staff really puts that together on on um, Time.com. So Jonathan had this idea last April that he brought to us. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting. It, it turned into such a big, epic project. Um, it's really about innovation. Um, it's about photography and sort of a, a three-dimensional project, like really taking it beyond the image and how people are really interacting with photography. So I think we are going to get a little bit into the weeds. Um, but to really talk through how he came up with this and all the steps he took to make it. So this is Jonathan Woods. Thank you. And and we'll start from the from the from the back, which is this picture was the that was the result of, of the project. But let's start with just where this idea came from and how did you pitch it originally and, and we're talking about last April, right? So this is about a year, this was almost exactly a year ago that you, you brought this into a light box pitch meeting. It all really started out, I mean, people ask me a lot, where did this start? And it really started with me wanting to climb up to the top of the Empire, to the top of the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center. Um, and there were really two origins. Uh, this was the first and it was Joe McNally's image of Tom Silliman climbing up to change the flashing red light bulb. Um, interesting thing about this picture, it was photographed, if you look at the bottom of this photograph, it's the summer of 2001. When this published in October of 2001, uh, the Twin Towers standing in the background of the photo uh, had just been eliminated from the New York City skyline. So there's a little bit of a strange synchronicity uh, between this project and, and the beginning of mine, which started with this picture. Um, and of course, it's you know for me it was more it was more than just getting up there and bringing a singular camera with me. It was about inventing a way to take this and make it something that's more interactive and more uh, something that's just going to help it be multi-dimensional and really to help you encapsulate what was taken away when the twin towers fell, which was that view. So Jonathan comes into the light box meeting in time, and we're usually pitching photographers, photography you know, different people to write about. And Jonathan pitches himself going to the top of One World Trade to make a picture like this that he's, uh, he's, he's pitching. Um, and I, you know, was like, that's, that's a great idea, sounds like a great plan, and let's just see what kind of access you can get to do this. So. So really, what ended up happening was, uh, I was like, oh, well, I, so that's a yes, you know? I mean, she's actually gonna let me do it. And then I realized, okay, now I have this mountain to climb in front of me, which is the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, which is taller than any mountain in the world when it comes to bureaucracy. And, uh, and that's where I really had to figure out how to articulate what it was that I actually wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and talk about the state of that building right then. It was not finished. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this photo, this was photographed in uh, roughly April of 2013, so right around the time I would have made the pitch. And if you notice, there's cranes on top of the building. So when I called the Port Authority and I said that I wanted to go up to the top of the building, they're kind of like, huh? Like, there's no top on the building yet. And I said, well, I'm thinking ahead. Like, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to plan ahead. So what was what was really insane to, to understand was that we were we were to track and with the Port Authority while they were in the midst of construction, not having blueprints, not having any idea of what it was going to look like up there. I'm trying to conceive something to be able to work and to be able to like to pitch to them, come on, why don't you trust me? You know? 
So I think one of the things that Jonathan from the beginning realized was that it wasn't just going to be a still image. It, he wanted it to be interactive. And so in order to do that, he partnered with Gigapan from the beginning. And this is just a, a document of um, a Gigapan image from the inauguration. And it, it was a, it's an interactive picture where you can click on where different people are and it goes 360 degrees. And it was this was like part of the inspiration for partnering with them to do this. Yeah, and, and it's the other half of, you know, Joe, Joe McNally had the great idea to go to the top of the Empire State Building and shoot the photo, but then what was actually going to take that and make it real, make it multidimensional, and it was really Gigapan bringing their brains behind this, their platform for it, their hardware for it, uh, that, you know, enabled us to take, you know, and this is a living, breathing thing, you know, you can zoom in on, you know, President Obama with his hand on the Bible on the stage, so I wanted that kind of clarity, I wanted that kind of resolution, um, but I also knew that we had, you know, we had to do our homework, and you know that that just goes to say, like, we had to solve for all the things that the Port Authority wasn't telling us, and you know that involved me going out to charter a boat with a buddy of mine. We, you know, we went around to start to look at the trade center, and because the Port Authority wasn't releasing any information to us, you know, we said, well, how tall is it? You know, and they're like, oh, and they just wouldn't answer your email. You'd send them ten emails, you might get one response back. It's kind of like watching Jay Carney at a White House press briefing. briefing. Uh, you know, it's like you get like three non-answers, and you got to just pin them down, and finally you get sort of an answer. Um, so, got a 600 millimeter lens, got on a boat, got a, you know just started flanking the building, and we started doing photo research on the wires. This is the only way we were able to really investigate visually what this thing could be. And I think what's important to understand when you look at these pictures is that you're seeing six out of seven sections of the spire. You're seeing everything but the top. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're trying to develop some way to think about this and you know, just going off pictures that I've taken. Well, also, it's not, you weren't going up there with a camera and just taking a picture, right? Talk about what your vision was for that. You had to attach a camera to make, you were trying to make a 360 degree. Yeah, and this is where it gets tricky because if you looked at what they thought the building was going to look like, we didn't really know where we could actually attach it. So this research was really imperative to informing how we would execute you know, a pretty gnarly logistical nightmare. Um, and and then we got the, the, the wire photo of the actual beacon uh, sitting down near the base of the building. This is a godsend. You know, I got this photo. It was like a diamond in the rough. I thought, oh my gosh, like, you know, this is not more than a couple of days before this fire was hoisted to the top of the building on May 10th. Uh, so I, you know, I pitched this April 4th, and now May 10th, this thing is sitting at the base of the building. Um, and I thought, okay, now I think I get it. I think I, I think I can figure out. So I had this weird image in my head I'm like this is where I want it. this is where I want to go with it so then this is a reincarnation of a bar napkin sketch um, <laughs> that didn't survive uh, but May 1st uh, nine days before they hoist the beacon up to the top of the spire I had that image and I thought okay well there's there's a few ways we can approach this you know we can either and I'm just gonna hop up for a second this is far more interesting if I can actually tell you. So I'm like, here's the boring way we can do it. We can, we can put a tripod down here, but if you think about a 360 panorama, the camera spins around, you see everything. And the last thing that I wanted to see is all that junk that you saw in the last photo, all the mechanics and everything. Like, you want to see the beacon, you want to see this thing, the crowning element, of, but you can't do it like Burj Khalifa, they shot right on top. That, that point doesn't exist here. So we knew that we had to attach somewhere to be able to get out from the building. So we thought, well, yeah, the railing's perfect, right? We'll just put like a super clamp on there. So this is so then then we got really technical. We got into AutoCAD. We're like, okay, you know, I don't know AutoCAD. I'd have to get another degree to learn that program. Um, and I'm I'm not an engineer, but I have engineering in my blood. My grandfather's an engineer. Um, this is Kira's biggest praise and criticism of me. So I always think about things like an engineer, but I need to have more heart. Um, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so like we came up with this. We're like, well, we're gonna attach this big bar. <laughs> so we bring this down to the Port Authority, 
And they're like, are you guys out of your minds? Like, you're not attaching to the railing. Like, that is not safe. That is a, it's a safety railing. And like, we did research on the railings, and you, you could put a rhinoceros in there, and it wouldn't break through the railings. But they just didn't like the idea of just putting stuff on the railing. So it was back to the drawing board. And meanwhile, like, the clock is ticking. So we start doing more wire research, and then we see this photo. And it's high resolution enough that we can actually start to see some of the detail about you know, beyond just the railing. And these are all engineering words. I mean, this is not my vocabulary, but the hoist points were like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. Like, that's what they're going to use to lift it. And they're not telling us this. Like, we're figuring this out on our own. Like, there's four hoist points on this thing. And if they go up there with a little zip wheel, a little grinder, they could cut one of those off for it. I mean, we're totally blue sky in this thing, because it's like, well, if they cut one off for us, we could slip something in there and, like, put a pin through. And then, yeah, so if, but we keep going back and forth with this, the Port Authority. Like, well, will you, will you give us this information? Will you give us that information? And they finally gave us the blueprints under non disclosure agreement. Uh, they gave us all the information that we needed to be able to make most of the decisions that we needed to make. So, um, we're going to show you a clip of the raising of the spire. And this is a Port Authority clip that we had access to, that Jonathan was able to get access to. Just so you can see the scale and the height. Um, and this was, the, we used this clip in a film that we did, a Red Border film with Shaul Schwartz, who directed it. We did, we laid, as once Jonathan finished the project, we knew we wanted to really get the heart of the iron workers that built the building. So Shaul directed a film about this. And this is from that film. Where it was definitely one of the most exciting days here and satisfaction days here. It was also the most stressful day. Here. <laughs> so keep in mind, we were going to climb this so the thing. the stress, we're doing so many things here that were firsts putting the crane up on top of the doghouse, jumping this crane to a height that the crane never jumped to. We were able to set the spire. We had about this much left between the top of the crane and the top of the spire. I mean, you know, on paper, that's okay. When you're up there at 1,701 feet, waiting for that last piece of the spire to come out here. And then the wind kicks in a little bit. And, I mean, you can't even begin to understand the scale, you know? I mean, there's a whole stairwell. I mean, that is a huge, a huge area at the top and just the height of where you are, you know? So, I mean, I just thought he was crazy the entire time. I mean, he kept, and he kept, he did not stop. He just, he's on a boat making pictures. He's got sketches. He's like, I mean, and I was saying earlier, you know, I've produced some really hard shoots with, you know, from world leaders to uh, major musicians and celebrities, and access is hard. And the Port Authority does not compare to any of them. You know, I mean, to get, to attach something to the top of that building, or to allow that to happen, you know, so the amount, I just, I think it's interesting to just go through that because it, it really speaks, like Jonathan figured out how to make that picture. So, yeah. <laughs> so, having seen the video of this fire going up, you guys understand now that that is a 405 foot structure that's attached to the top of the building. That's what brings it to the full 1776 feet. One of the things that we had to figure out once we got up there, well not before we got up there, we had to figure out where of those hoist points, which one we wanted to attach to. So. We worked with uh, Digital Globe, which is the largest commercial satellite imagery provider in the world. Um, and this photograph was taken on May 10th, the same day, coincidentally, that the spire was, the, the top final segment of the beacon was hoisted up, hoisted up to the spire. In the full resolution version, it's a 270 meg file, you can zoom in from space and actually see the hoist points on the spire. It's 50 centimeters out. It's amazingly sharp imagery. Uh, so anyway, so we figured out exactly, you know, 
the building, the beacon sits like this, where is north? What do we want to see? If we put it on this point, do we see the Statue of Liberty? What do we not want to see? New Jersey. What do we want to see? Manhattan. You know, we want to see all the iconic things that people know and love about New York City. No offense to New Jersey. But, you know, there's a blind spot. There's always going to be a blind spot at 360. And this one had a particular disadvantage. And we had to figure out where to position it to best execute the photo. Insane. You know, these guys have no visual acute acumen whatsoever. These guys, are, I mean, it's like you're educating very young children when, when it comes to, like, what you're trying to... They're like, they understand construction, and they understand manpower, and they understand press releases. So getting them to understand, wanting to attach this thing to the building, you have to teach them. You have to be patient with them. And that, that I think, has, I mean, that's made me better in other aspects of my life, because I'm thicker skinned in, in all regards. Uh, so we tried to do all these different diagrams, and we bring this one down, and they're like, the beacon doesn't look like that. And we're like, would you just, would you just humor me for a minute? And you're like in a room full of engineers. There's no humor. Uh, so design after design after design gets shot down, gets shot down, gets shot down. We finally, you know, we finally said, okay, well, what about something like this? And I just remember there was one meeting that we had where it was a bunch of key people: engineering, safety, construction, DCM, uh, all these guys, a lot of acronyms. And, um, and they look at it, and there's one guy over in the corner of the room that says, I think that might work. If, it, if they do this, it might work. And if you do it this way, with this material, and we're just sitting there writing down everything, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, it's finally like you've been able, allowed to peer into the, into the Bible that they have down there and just get the knowledge that you need, use it to inform your decision, move on. So we came up with that. And we went back, we went to final design on it, and between May and August 7th, uh, we came up with this. And this was our final design. So what you're seeing there is, it's, this is the, the very top of the spire, it's the beacon on top of the spire, and this, this arm that's extending out to the right is the aluminum arm, we call it a jib. Uh, it's a pretty industry standard term, so we'll call it a jib. And it, it extends 13, out from the, 13 feet out from the building. So, and talk about, so you had to literally custom build that too. Do you want to, did you see how that built in? So basically what happened at that point is we had to go find somebody that was willing to build this thing. And uh, we ended up going down to Asheville, North Carolina and uh, working with a guy, this lunatic that used to weld on um, nuclear reactors for like 40 years. Uh, but he's a very good welder. Uh, you know, all the welds were x-rayed, so we knew the exact strength of these welds that we were putting up there. Um, you know, it was tested in a wind tunnel. We threw seven mile an hour winds at it to see if it would break. Um, you know, we, we kind of had to go through all everything just to make sure that it was... And then there was a testing process, so... And yeah. you were working with these guys in Portland from Gay Pan. So we actually, we had to build two jibs. We built one that we sent to Portland and one that we shipped up to New York. And the one that we shipped to Portland, uh, I went out there, um, you know, what was it, it was uh, six days later, the next weekend I was out in Portland. So I was in Asheville, North Carolina one week, and the next weekend I was out in Portland. Um, you know, and then we were like, well, we got, and I guess the important thing to know here is like, I had to work with somebody on this that was actually going to climb this fire with me. And he was going to be a guy from Gigapan. I could not do it without him. He could not do it without me. So I had to know that I was going to be in a position where I wasn't going to want to knock this guy out up there. And you spend five hours with somebody in a high stress environment, you want to know that he's not going to get shaky. So I said, well, let's go get up somewhere high. So, and talk about how you, what was your test? You well, had to get you had to get high, right? You couldn't just do it on the floor. Portland's a great place to do that. Um, uh, so we end up going to Portland, and uh, Gigapan had a really good relationship with the Oregon Department of Transportation, and they said, "Well, do you guys want to go up on one of our highest bridges?" And he said, "Well, can we go up on the highest bridge?" And I said, "Well, sure." So they just closed down a lane of traffic on an interstate. I mean, this is the Pacific Northwest. This would never happen in New York. It's like it's almost a blessing that we had to go out to Portland for the testing. So this is a uh, a quick video that will show you. So.
So this whole process was designed to replicate all the errors that we could encounter climbing up on top of the World Trade Center. We had to be in a high place, we had to be using all the same equipment, we had to be using everything the way we would, cramped, not being able to sit down for a long time, and, and then we went back and we looked at the camera and there was nothing on it. <laughs> so, Good thing you did the test. <laughs> Turn the camera yeah. on. <laughs> so we had to go back and forth for a while and figure out Ultimately, what we ended up doing is we ended up writing a play-by-play. -play. Everything, every step, every piece of equipment, every safety pin, even down to the snacks and the bottles of water that we would bring out there that day. There's no bathrooms, there's no restaurants. All you have is electricity and enough room to stand. Um, down, down to the granola bar uh, and what every pack weighed to. Because so we had to carry all this stuff up there. And you know, if we couldn't lift it, we had 175 pounds of gear to bring up with us. So we had to carry that stuff up a 405 foot ladder. Um, so all that, all that planning, all the preparation, um, you know, that, that led us to the point where we're like, okay, we called the Port Authority and then we said like, okay, we're ready. And at that point, had the Port Authority approved your? No, no, I mean, we, they could have completely shut us down right then and there. They, would, they, could, have, they could have said, we don't like this. So the beam that got built, the, all of that original work that he did, the testing in Portland, all that, it had still not been approved fully from Port Authority. They had to still, they had to look at it all and approve it. So then he went down a couple of days before the picture was to be made. So yeah, so uh, Friday, September 20, Thursday, September 26th, we went down uh, to meet with a bunch of stern-faced people. Um, and I told them, you know, everything's great. You know, we have a certificate of insurance, we have liability insurance, we have all this. And I said, one thing I forgot to mention is gonna be a helicopter up there filming us too. And, and these guys, I mean, it, you could have heard a pin drop next to the World Trade Center. I was like, a helicopter? How did you fail to mention that? I mean, it's like a public airspace. You guys don't, you don't, you don't control the airspace. I mean, like, we need to know about everything. I'm like, all right, there's gonna be a helicopter. So we went through that, they looked at it, and Again, line by line, we you know we pulled all these plans. They're like, we don't want to look at this. And they they look at this thing. And they're like, you guys did a really nice job manufacturing this. <laughs> like, and they they said a couple of nice things about the the work. And then you know once we had buy-in from some of the key stakeholders, and it was an automatic, you guys are good to go. And that was that. I mean, we went we went down there. I was on pins and needles because they they pulled the plug on that. That last several months of planning was completely in vain. Completely in vain. So then we got to go up on top of the roof. That was my first time on the roof, and it was amazing up there. So that's about uh, 13, 14, 1,400 feet up. And this was two days before you made the picture. My first time being up there was two days. This is the closest I've gotten to actually scouting. So this is just like visual verification at this point. We should have brought binoculars, but we were just so happy we got to go up there. And then there was Saturday the 28th, when we actually got to climb. Uh, I play this video for you because it's important to understand that that black arm at the bottom center is 13 feet long. There's a ro that, that weighs 75 pounds. The rope that it's attached to weighs another 70 pounds. Oops, I'm gonna hit play, not next. strong. Uh, we would not have had the strength to do this on our own. So then we start climbing ourselves. <laughs> Sorry guys, I keep doing that. Um, so literally when you look through the ladder when you're climbing on the outside of the structure, there's nothing but you and the wind and the spire. Oh my god. <laughs> and the entire Manhattan skyline. It's kind of beautiful. I love it. This is like right up my alley. 
And talk about your safety. Were you tethered to anything? Right. At yeah. this point, there's a there's a friction trolley which you see in the middle of the ladder. Um, so we all were wearing full body harnesses, but you're not really clipped in for some of the points where you you need to get from A to B. So, I mean, it's it's safe. It's safe. You know. <laughs> it's safe. So then keep in mind, like what, one of the coolest things about this project was being up there, looking out and seeing helicopters and airplanes below you. <laughs> uh, and then being able to lean over the edge of the railing. And then again, you know, being able to climb the final section of the spire was probably one of the highlights of my life. It wasn't probably, it was one of the highlights of my life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sign a will before you climb up there? <laughs> no. Were you tethered in there? Were you hooked in there? Like, there's a little friction trolley that rides up in the channel with you. You would fall, but it have compelled you? Well, I mean... I don't know, I didn't fall. I mean, it, it, it felt like it would grab, but just like, I mean, it's, you know. So notice too, if you guys look at the guys on top of the, on top of the spire, they're straddling the railing up there. And they're just hanging out, right? Like they sat up there like that all day long. Uh, so then after we climbed up to the top, I couldn't help but just hold my iPhone out straight out and snap a picture down. And then you had to attach this, you had to attach the beam. Yeah. So, so then in the wind, and how, was it windy up there? It's about 25 mile per hour winds for a solid five hours. Really bad wind burn. So then basically the process was we assembled it, we had to put the camera on it, we had to hook up all these cables, we had to hook up a laptop, and once we got it attached, you can see that hoist point there in the center where that black jib comes down to the center. This is, it's really important to understand that the, the jib was designed in such a way that it would be invisible in the photograph. And you'll see that when you look at it and when you play with the interactive version of it. But by its design, this was so that you could see the spire. You wouldn't see all that nasty crap where we're standing, and then you would be able to look straight down and see an entire 360 degrees around. And that's what it looked like from the opposite side. And even like the design of this computer board, this remote, we call it a remote interface board, it's a tiny little computer on there that remote controls the jib, because we couldn't go out there and touch it. So if anything turned off, if anything needed to be adjusted, we had to do it all remotely. So we worked in tandem with Gigapan to develop software to be able to remote capture all the photos, to be able to remote operate the robot. It's the first time they had ever been doing that, and they're now marketing that as a product. Um, it wasn't exactly pretty, but it worked. And we were happy. <laughs> so when we came back, we had 567 images in total, 21 by 27. And that was when the not fun work started. Um, what we noticed was there was a lot of irregularity. If you shoot a panorama over three hours, there's a lot of variance in the light. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't come out quite the way you thought they would. And the wind, even though you built something that's incredibly strong, is going to move a little bit. So we ended up with a lot of little things that had to be adjusted in post-production, it was just literally dragging the corners of one picture to line up with the other picture. That was kind of messy. It didn't look that bad up there. So literally for two months, we spent going back and forth on this. What do you mean going back and forth? Well, going back and forth, like, you know, we it took an hour and a half. That's a good question. Thank you. It took an hour and a half to open the picture on my Mac at work. Uh, Actually, we got a faster computer just to be able to work on the project. Uh, hour and a half to open it, hour and a half to save it, and then any time that you did working on the actual photo itself.
generation I work up from my father's side and third from my mother's. This is like four years on the job, the longest job I've ever been on. I can't compare this job to no job, never. This is like a one-time deal. See something? Say something. Call one eight 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 NYC Safe to report suspicious activity. Wake up in the dark, get home in the dark. Every day. seven days a week, 10 hours a day. You miss your family, you hardly see them, you don't see them. You give up five years of your life for this. And then you get from start to end. It's coming over here. This place is home. They're home no more. It's a good question. My mom did not know. Um, <laughs> my dad knew and he told me not to tell my mom. <laughs> when, did, when did your mom find out? That night. I called her when I got down. I said, she said, I had a feeling you were doing it. I knew something was going on. Thank you for calling. I'm glad you're safe. How many individual images were photo? How many individual images were shot and like what was the Total file size of all this must have been huge. 567 photos. It was 567 photos over the course of three, five. We were out there for five hours. We were shooting for about three. Uh, total file size was 14 and a half gigabytes, which is why it took my computer so long to open it. It's a massive, massive file. Um, this is for Kara. How do you budget for something like this? I mean, when he walks in the door and says, oh, I have this idea. Um, I mean, I know when that happens here at Aperture, it's like, oh, okay. Um, let's make this book. How much is this book gonna cost? So, I mean, how expensive was this cover? <laughs> well, the good thing was that it was sold. We had a sponsor on the project at oh, the yeah. end, oh, and, yeah. um, and that was great. Fabulous. So that's the answer to the question. No. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I think it's really important to be ambitious, and if it gets realized, we make it happen. You know, and it's like, I think, I'm not going to say that I was skeptical that it could happen, but the fact that he got to that point, I mean, you know, it was, I think, I mean, ultimately, it was, it was a lot of more, in terms of money, it was more about his time. Look, he was down in North Carolina, he was building this, he was in Portland, he was, like, it was, he was also running .com, and so I think, you know, it was so incredible, like, if something has that much magic attached to it, that even, because so many people ask me, like, how do you predict the weather? It's like, we didn't, but it was a gorgeous day, and it was a perfect day to make a picture like that. But it's yeah, it was an expensive project. But I think we, when it's when a project like that matters so much, like to time, we can fund it and figure it out. And ultimately, a good project like that gets sponsored, hopefully, which it did. Um, and it really got so much play for us 
beyond it being on the cover, I mean, it was on TV. It, it really let drove the launch of our website, which was great, because we, you know, so I'm not totally answering it, but I think, no, no. you know, we don't, we, you, you, we've got to just see at what point, like, okay, if we get to a certain point, then we bring it to the managing editor and say, okay, it might be, you know, this is where we are, if it happens, <laughs> yeah, and it did, so. What, what kind of camera did you use, and did you sell more magazines that week than average, or was it the same print run or whatever? I'll take the first question. Uh, the camera was a 5D Mark III. It was a 100 millimeter, uh, 2.8 macro lens. And there's a very specific reason we wanted to use a 5D Mark III, because it was light. Uh, there's a Nikon camera that I don't know off the top of my head that has a higher pixel density. But the 100 millimeter lens, I, I'm not familiar with the Nikon series of lenses as much as I am Canon, but um, it, it really, we went with the macro lens because of the focal length. Uh, we needed to be shooting at a high aperture, focusing to something that was very close to us, which was the beacon. It was important that we were able to do that. So we were striking a balance between subject distance and aperture. I mean, so it's, it was a complicated arrival to that decision to use that. I mean, I would have loved to have a 400 millimeter lens, but we couldn't be up there for 10 hours. We did sell more more magazines that week. Um, I think we're still waiting for all of that information to come in. But what, what else we did was we sold prints. Um, Jonathan, we set up a, you know, people, you can buy a print, and some of that um, went to the 9-11 9-11 Memorial, Memorial. But it's like, we it, that was kind of cool that we you can click on it and you can buy it. Um, and that was a, a new innovative thing that we did at time for that too. Um, yeah, and actually we got, I was saying this earlier, we got a lot of um, angry subscribers because um, the, the label at the bottom was covering the, I mean, actually like, it's, the label's a little bit bigger than that. So they were like, can you can you publish that part of the picture so we can tape it to the rest of it? And we did. Nancy Gibbs in her editor's letter the next week, like did we sized it exactly with scissors so you could cut it out because subscribers were like upset that they were you know that, that they were missing that part of the picture, which was really cute. And I always think like just says speaks to the power of print. Yes. You know. Um, so yeah, I think that dentist office everywhere we're <laughs> really happy to have this cover and they're all out calling us for more copies. Question for Jonathan. Um, it, it seems to me, at least from everything you've said here today, that, that this has been a, an incredibly long planning project. Um, it, it took over a year for you to get this thing in place. Am I correct in that? Yes. So my question to you is, have you always been this obsessive? <laughs> <laughs> my my mom says I'm a projects person. <laughs> so yes, I, I think the short answer is yes. And I've always had some of those weird eccentric hobbies. I mean, you know, like, you know, from the fire department to rock climbing, I mean, that, that is the heights part of it, but there's this, you know, I mean, I was taking apart my dad's Texas Instruments calculator when I was five years old, to, and I wanted, I wanted the ink roller clean, so I was cleaning the ink roller, my dad was furious, of course, when he comes home and like, he's like, why is my printer not working, and all the numbers are in backwards. So I've always had like a mind for solving problems, and I'm not always the best at it, but um, I, I like tinkering with things, and this is, this is an extension of that. Well, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think the thing that impresses me the most about the entire project is just the incredible planning that's gone into every single minute detail, including building the arm and just incredible. Thanks, and I think it's really a testament to the people that, you know, I work with, because I couldn't have done it alone. You know, the mechanical engineer saw 150 problems that I never would have foreseen. And Mike Franz, who has a, just a different brain than either one of us, Michael Long, the engineer, and myself, 
and he was seeing all these other things. And then, you know, Kira said, well, you know, Jonathan, what about your team? <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, you know, so everybody was kind of looking out for me and the project, and it was like, it was, a, it was only a success because of everybody that pitched in and was mindful of like, hey, watch, watch your six, you know. Just on the whole, how many people would you say that you collaborated with that made this happen? It was over a hundred. Over a hundred. Yes. Both within and without the walls of time. Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And it's 14 organizations, all told. So, so when you were selling this to, to the Port Authority, at what point did they get on the vision? I mean, I mean, was there anybody there who could like grab the vision part of it? It's a really good question. It is a really good question. And it took a long time. <clears throat> I think when you fail to articulate an idea correctly, you're failing as a person with that idea to convey your vision. And one of the most difficult, I mean, you know, I, I, I can sit up here all day long and say that the Port Authority is difficult to work with, but maybe I'm just not that good at pitching stories. So I think that this taught me a lot about how to really specifically articulate my vision to somebody about what I want to do in a succinct way, in a way that they can understand, digest, and believe in, and it's the last part that's the most important because if they wouldn't have believed in it, it never would have happened. And it took, you know, really, you know, the Port Authority media relations is who I had to convince because then they, in turn, went to DCM Erectors, who runs all the structural steel on the site. They went to all the other organizations, the electricians, to make sure that we were able to plug in a cord up there. These are all union shops, and the unions have rules, and. You know, the only way around this is to like build relationships, and it was really, I mean, a year of building a relationship with these guys to make it happen. For both of you, no. is there any new achievement taking uh, this big goal as, as a starting point? Uh, I think that there are many new ideas uh, before this, this big one achievement. I don't, I don't know if I understand uh, the question. It's like, in, in terms of photography and in terms of Time Magazine and web, is there any new achievement to, to go to do taking this as a starting point? This is a break point, I guess, in so many ways. You're going to do it again. I, mean, I will absolutely try and do it again if she'll let me. Uh, but I think it's, I mean, this speaks to a bigger, a new, you know, a new culture that we're all really figuring out like what is the future what is like what are the technologies that we want to believe in you know I mean red border films is certainly a part of that that you know everybody wants to be a part of and, and you know Gigapan interactive photo you know 360 interactive photos are a part of that but the way that we share and consume media I think is at the core of this that's the bigger thing it's how are we sharing and consuming media I mean Kira do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah I think uh, I think it's an inspiring project that will inspire other things. Um, I don't know what they are yet, but it's it is about innovation. This project, you know, and I think it, I really wanted Jonathan. I've been sitting in his office for the last day, you know, on like show what went into that because I think people think, oh, he took a picture from the top of the building, and really, like, you know, the planning was so. Truly, it wouldn't have happened without his, like, even persistence and thoughtful. I mean, he believed so much in the vision, and I think that inspires a whole staff of people at time. What else can I do? I mean, he walked into a light box meeting and was like, I want to do this project. And, and that is so inspiring to see someone actually do that. And then to see it realized the way the time can realize it, you know, because we have a huge audience. and. Um, and people really could engage with that, and we could put it on the cover, and then, so when you can see something like that happen, it, I think more than anything, it just inspires creativity and, and innovation, and you know, within people doing other things. So, yeah, I think, I think that for now, Jonathan is in New York, and he's not climbing any more buildings, and <laughs> he's going to take a vacation soon, I think. But, um, but I'm sure he, you know, he's done some really great projects since he's been at Time, so. This is the second of, of what he's done. Now, I think Time is like the last of the news weeklies left. Newsweek sort of. Uh, well, Newsweek is back. Oh, right, right. 
Yeah, but for a while it was like soft lifestyle type news, and then it, okay. But you guys are still hard news every week. So my question is, how in general, how is the business going for Time Magazine? And uh, I think my suggestion, you know, just out of the blue, is that if you had covers of that quality image, uh, you'd sell more magazines, I think. I don't know what percentage of your sales are newsstands, but it really makes it exciting. Uh, and does management see a bigger role for photography inside of the magazine than, let's say, 10 years ago? where people had to buy it for their news because they didn't have the internet? Uh, a couple of um, um, so um, what is that? Yeah, how's, how's time doing in general? Or I think time is doing well. There's been a huge investment in digital. Um, we have a lot of new staff um, on digital. And there, I mean, this project shows, I think, the kind of emphasis that time puts on photography. And that's what makes it great for us to work there because, you know, photography is in the DNA, in the in the Gene Smith, you know, tradition to this, you know, and it, on the way here I was like, this isn't exactly Gene Smith, but how can we, you know, like, but it is excellent and it is, it's like what you were saying yeah. earlier, but it is about, you know, I think we have a lot of different kinds of photography and we're even turning photographers into filmmakers. So, we're trying to do a lot of different kinds of things, you know. Um, and photography is very critical to what time is. We have Time Lightbox, our photo blog. Um, you know, our covers are really important. We just, we do photojournalism, so we, we do a lot. And I think, you know, we'll see. But, but right now, we're doing well. We're, um, and as I said, I think that we're just trying to figure out the, the digital, like how to keep going with that innovation. What's, what's the status of Newsweek now? So I don't. Can't really speak to Newsweek, but it, it is back in some to some capacity. I, I mean, I'm not sure. It's not. It it just came back again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, did, when you were um, preparing and photographing, did anybody ever consider you a security risk? I mean, in terms of. <laughs> you were stalking this building for God's sake. So. No, but I, I think, I don't know, I, I'd like to think I was smart enough about it that I didn't draw attention to myself. I mean, one person on a boat, I mean, granted the 600 millimeter, three foot long telephoto <laughs> lens is yeah. kind of an eyesore, but blended in with the white boat. Um, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was never, you know, the research that I was doing was more, I mean, I did a lot of research into the building. I did a lot of research into, like, what is the current plan? Like, what are what architectural renderings are available from the building that I can actually get my hands on? Um, and then, like, the boating trip was, like, the one big photo excursion where, you know, we really spent three hours intensely just, like, in New York Harbor and every angle we could find around uh, Lower Manhattan to photograph that, to see it, to find a different angle on it, to figure out, uh, and I just like going out in the water. Um, but aside from that, no, I mean, I never had any hiccups. There was never any problems, and I wasn't stupid about it. I mean, the people that, I think that in the wake of 9-11, the kind of crackdown that you saw on people photographing federal buildings, which was then later repealed, you know, they're, they're, they loosened up. I mean, people are getting a little bit, they're more used to people with cameras than they were well, Nine obviously they didn't have high security on the building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. anyway. yeah, they let anybody in. Um, I have two questions. One is, in the process of this project, was there ever a point where you yourself said, forget it, this is, it was a stupid idea? Right. Or did anyone try to kind of talk you out of, out of it and say, you know, hey man, maybe you should just drop this? Um, and my other question is, um, when you actually were up, the day you actually climbed up, did, did you ever, was there ever a moment when you were like, bad idea? Did you have, did you have that kind of? <laughs> I'll answer the second question first. Um, I, I, there was only one moment up there where I was a little bit anxious, and we had a couple little finicky computer issues. Uh, just communicating with it, and there was one point where one of the iron workers had to go over the railing, and they lowered the jib, and he had to climb down the ladder 
from the railing side, because he didn't want to waste the time. This was also subsequently the guy who was arrested for jumping off of the building with a parachute. Um, but he climbed down the ladder over the railing that he had been sitting on all day. He's like, oh, my leg's asleep. And uh, he gets down onto the ladder, and he, he snakes his leg through the ladder, and he's sitting there with no hands on him. And he's, I'm like talking him through. I'm like, this guy is going to fall. And I'm like, oh, wait, he's clipped. He's fine. Uh, as long as the safety clip is OK. But anyway, it was fine. But the safety glitches during, or the, the tech glitches were kind of really freaking me out a little bit that day. I mean, it's because if you don't get it, like we didn't have another opportunity to go back up there. I mean, the windows closed, and you know, I mean, then they, it took eight months to get us that far. Um, and then to your first question, uh, I had to talk myself into it a lot. There was a lot of times when, you know, I mean, I think that we both throughout you know, within and without the organization, there's always you know people that may not check their emails quite as much as you'd like them to. They may not pick up the phone, um, and you know the port authority's got a lot on their plate, and they have a lot of people to get back to, and a lot of people are calling them. Every every media request that comes in for the for One World Trade goes to the port authority in New York and New Jersey. You don't get on that site unless you go through basically two guys, and when I wrote the first month, I mean they basically hung up on me the first time I called. They're like. No, I don't really, send me an email. Like, this is going nowhere. So it was a lot of just continuing to talk yourself into it. You use your friends, you use your colleagues, you use your boss, and they, you know, they kind of help give you the pep talk you need at the right time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.